Hello and welcome to the Unit 5 lecture on asepsis and infection control. Your competency is to provide nursing care for patients with integumentary disorders. Learning objectives are listed here. Please familiarize yourselves with them in preparation for class. Here are additional learning objectives specific to pressure injuries. There are many organisms that cause infection. Bacteria and viruses are probably the most common. Unfortunately, multi-drug resistant organisms or superbugs are becoming even more common. Infection requires one of six chains to be present. If you break any link in the chain of infection, you stop infection. Hand washing is the most important way to stop the spread of infection. Nosocomial infections are a real problem for patients who are probably already compromised. Common healthcare-associated infections include catheter-associated UTIs, surgical site infections, C. diff, central line-associated bloodstream infections, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. Reimbursement for complications of hospital-acquired or associated infections may be denied. Additionally, they increase costs, length of stay, and patient mortality. Hand hygiene is the most important thing you can do to stop the spread of infection. So when should you wash your hands? At the beginning and end of your shift, before contact with a patient, between contacts with different patients, before and after contact with wounds and dressings, specimens or bedclothes, before performing any invasive procedure, before administering meds, after contact with any patient secretion or excretion, after body fluid exposure, after contact with patient's environment, before and after using the bathroom, after sneezing, coughing, or blowing your nose, after removing gloves, before eating. In other words, when in doubt, wash, even if you had gloves on. Hand sanitizer is an acceptable alternative, but not with C. diff. It does not kill the spores, so soap and water is a must. Uh, also, remember, keep your fingernails short and avoid nail polish because these harbor bacteria. Standard precautions are used with every patient. They include basic precautions such as hand washing and gloves. Isolation precautions are special precautions for patients with certain communicable diseases such as MRSA or TB. Contact precautions include wearing gloves and a gown when entering the patient's room and is for diseases such as MRSA. Modified contact precautions are the same as contact precautions, but they require the use of soap and water instead of hand sanitizer. This is for C. diff. Droplet precautions require the use of gloves and a surgical mask and is indicated for diseases such as disseminated shingles and influenza. Airborne precautions require a negative pressure room and the use of a special respirator mask as well as gown and gloves. This is indicated for TB and other diseases. Reverse isolation is used in high-risk situations to prevent infection in people whose body defenses are known to be compromised. It is to protect them from us. Remember to use therapeutic communication techniques when interacting with the client in isolation. It's important to maintain regular contact with isolated patients. They're at risk for neglect and failure to rescue. In one study, it was found that compared with controls, patients isolated for infection control precautions experience more preventable adverse effects, express greater dissatisfaction with their treatment, and have less documented care. Basically, they're at risk for failure to rescue because providers may not go in as frequently as they should because it's not as convenient to gown and glove. Intact skin is the first line of defense against infection. Cells in saliva, mucus, tears, and sweat contain bactericidal enzymes. Normal skin flora protect against harmful bacteria. Leukocytes, or WBCs, and the inflammatory response is the second line of defense against infection. The inflammatory response is a nonspecific response to tissue injury. There's blood vessel dilation with increased plasma flow out of the capillaries and into irritated tissue. WBCs enter the area to attack and ingest bacteria. This leads to erythema, warmth, edema, pain, and functional impairment from edema or pain. The tissue is inflamed but not infected. A collection of dead leukocytes, digested bacteria, dead tissue cells, and plasma may result in pus formation. Fever increases cell metabolism and interrupts interrupts viral replication and slows bacterial growth. 
and increases leukocyte mobility and action. Antigens are foreign particles like microbes that enter the body and trigger an immune response when they enter the lymphatic and circulatory system. T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes then fight the microbes. Some T cells remain in the tissues and keep a memory of the antigen and can be reactivated quickly if the patient's re-exposed to the same antigen. This is cellular immunity. B lymphocytes produce plasma cells, which then produce antibodies that circulate in the bloodstream and act on microbes and viruses. This is humoral immunity. So what affects infection resistance? Infectious agents include bacteria, virus, fungi, parasites. Um, compromised hosts includes breaks in the skin and mucous membranes or invasive devices. Stasis of body fluids, inadequate nutrition, stress and hyperglycemia, immune system dysfunction, stasis of body fluids, such as with sedation or paralytics in ventilated patients, which suppresses coughing, sneezing, clearance, or respiratory secretions, can result in pneumonia. Malnutrition decreases uh, the body's ability to make antibodies and WBCs, making it hard to fight infection and increasing metabolic needs. Stress causes cortisol release, which suppresses the immune system and increases serum glucose, which is ideal for bacterial growth. Uh, this is why good glycemic control is imperative for hospitalized individuals. It helps them get better faster. Leukemia increases the production of leukocytes, but they are immature and unable to fight infection. And finally, drug therapy such as chemo, steroids, and inappropriate antibiotic use all affects normal resistance. Local infection is um, localized to a single body area. Systemic infection is infection that is spread to other areas or organs of the body. Bacteremia is infection that spreads through the bloodstream. SIRS is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Catching infection and treating it at this point has a greater chance of success than waiting for full-blown sepsis, which has a much higher mortality. It is important to realize that temperature can be high or low, and WBCs can be high or low with, with SIRS or sepsis. Low temperature or low WBCs is a bad sign because it means that the patient is using up all their defenses and their body has less ability to fight off the infection. Sepsis is a severe systemic inflammatory response to infection. Sepsis can progress to septic shock, which is characterized by hypotension and organ failure. Mortality is high and death usually results from organ failure related to microemboli clogging vascular beds and organs. So if you take one thing away from this slide, please, please, please remember that early recognition of SIRS is critical to patient survival and know your normals for your temperature, heart rate, respiratory, and WBC. Take a few minutes and think about some signs and symptoms of infection that you might see in your patients. The first step in the nursing process is always assessment. We're looking for normal pattern identification. Ask about normal measures taken to stay well. We look for risk identification like exposure to illness, smoking, drugs, sexual practices. And then during the physical assessment, we want to make sure that we perform a general inspection, check their vitals, listen to lungs, bowel sounds, um, feel their lymph nodes. Remember that early recognition of SIRS via physical assessment is key to providing or to improving mortality rates. Diagnostic labs and procedures include CBC. You look at the WBC or leukocytes. If it's increased, it's called leukocytosis. Um, neutrophils increase until they can't be produced quickly enough, and then immature granulocyte, granulocytes are released. These are bands, and if you see this, it's called a shift to the left. Remember, WBCs can be elevated or decreased with infection. The UAUC shows bladder infection, an ESR or SED rate, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, measures the rate at which red blood cells settle in the unclotted blood. The SED rate is elevated in inflammatory and infectious process, tissue necro necrosis, malignancy, or stress. Um, blood cultures check for bacteria in the blood, and a lactate level increases with infection due to anaerobic metabolism and tissue hypoperfusion. 
Other diagnostics include x-rays, CT scans, sputum, wound, fluid, stool, or throat cultures. After we assess, we cluster or group data together to form a nursing diagnosis. These are some possible diagnoses for infection. Next, we set the outcome and plan our nursing interventions. Then we implement our nursing interventions. These can focus on health promotion, such as personal hygiene, rest, and relaxation, or immunizations. Nursing interventions can also focus on altered function, such as comfort measures or antimicrobial therapy. And finally, we evaluate the interventions and whether or not our goals were met. If not, just revise the care plan. And this concludes our lecture on infection. Thanks and have a good day.